I would um, listen to other preachers and, and try and emulate some of the things that they do, or at least try and pick up some tips or learn from them. You know, mediocrity, imitation is the sincerest form of, grat- of flattery to pay respect, to honor, greatness. And so I would try and imitate other people. We see it in our culture where we imitate whatever Paris says is fashionable, although I think a lot of it's ugly. Um, but we, we, you know, it, it invades culture. Um, trends occur, uh, clothing patterns, you know, how they um, come and go. And um, I remember wearing bell bottoms, bell bottom pants the first time they came around, looking down and you can't see your shoes because the bottom of your pants are so big. I promised myself that if they ever come back in style, I'd go naked before I ever wore those bell bottoms again because I thought they were so ugly. But they're coming back. I mean, the, the bell bottoms, people wear bell bottoms. I thought it's so dumb. They were ugly the first time. Didn't you learn? That is not paying tribute to greatness. I saw somebody in a store yesterday. Remember the bibbed overalls? I mean, bibs, I mean, bibs are always in style. But remember the time? I was probably in college where it was fashionable to unhook one side and have one side hanging down the back. You remember that? Yeah, that was dumb too. I don't you know, you're like losing half of your security. I saw somebody in the store the other day wearing, doing that. They were short, bib shorts with one hanging down off the back. I thought, man, woman, you look ridiculous. I didn't say it. But, you know, trends, we, we, somebody says that this is popular and we tend to imitate. We, we want to look cool. I was never cool. Um, I, I'm old enough now that I've just given up, but I used to try to be when mullets came around the first time. I tried to have a mullet. Um, with my hairstyle, I couldn't have a mullet. I probably looked ridiculous. My parents loved me enough not to say anything, uh, but now I just look at kids and I'm thinking, what in the world? You look nasty. But anyway, we, we imitate and we try and replicate and we try and, you know, what's stylish, what's not stylish, what's in, what's going to get me accepted, what's going to get me love, what's going to get me attention. Then we imitate other people's behaviors, whether it's the footsteps you walk in, whether it's the clothes you wear, how you do your job, um, how you perform your hobby. You know, when we have a hobby, we look to somebody else as an example who's gone before us, and we try and imitate those kind of things. One, we want to get better. Two, we want to fit in. Uh, Maybe three, we want to be great. We want to be better. So we imitate other people, we imitate other things. The same thing should be true in our spiritual life. Turn to get your Bibles, pull out your phone, look at the book of Ephesians. I kind of struggled in how to narrow this down because when I look at this passage, I'm going to try and give some background to it in a minute um, after we read it, but... uh, there really is a couple chapters here that we, read, we need to read together, and I'm not going to read all that this morning. Um, refer to a couple things, but go back and for the context, um, read this whole section, maybe even this whole letter. It's not that big. Um, read this whole letter. Um, but there's some really good things. You get your Bibles, get your pens. There's some really good things in here uh, to highlight and to underline, okay? So we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 30 through chapter 5, verse 11, okay? So 4.30, he, he starts out, or he says, he, it's really picking up in the middle of the thought I'm going to mention here in a minute, but it says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. You should underline that. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all underline circle that bitterness rage anger harsh words slander as well as all types of evil behavior instead now he's drawing a contrast instead be kind to each other tender-hearted forgiving one another just as circle that just as God through Christ has forgiven you Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, 
impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, again, here's a contrast, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God, the, ki the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. And he goes on. And this, this passage, it shows uh, how we're to live and, and how we're to imitate Christ. If you look back up, um, we didn't read this, but if you look back up at verse 17, 17 through 19, Paul lays out the way that the world lives. This is the world's way of living, 17 through 19. Verses 20 through 24, Paul lays out how we're supposed to live. And then 25 through 30, he talks about what we're to stop doing. Paul is writing in the church of Ephesus, and the church of Ephesus was the third largest city in the entire Roman Empire, behind Rome and Alexandria. Third largest, over 250,000 people lived in the city of Ephesus. It was a highly sexualized city. Sound like American culture today? There was temples all over Ephesus to Artemis and Athena, uh, gods that were highly sexualized gods. So Paul is writing to this church, surrounded by people, surrounded by prosperity, surrounded by influence, surrounded by uh, a pagan culture, surrounded by things that are appealing to the base nature of humans that for a season is fun. And Paul is warning them, saying, hey, look, don't do this stuff. Don't, don't act like this. Don't, don't be this way. Don't think this way. Don't do the stuff that you see going on around you. There's a different way that we as, as, as Christians are supposed to live. So we're going to kind of walk through some of this again just to look at it a little more um, big word exegetically. What's Paul trying to say here? So we just kind of laid out the, the background, some of the context of what he's talking about in, in 417 up through uh, 3031. And in verse 32, he says this. He says, instead, be kind. So there, again, there is this, the switch, the transition that Paul is contrasting. There's compare and contrast. There's the world, there's God, there's the world, there's God, there's the world. There's, there's unholy, there's holy, there's this behavior back and forth that Paul is going to. And in 5.1, uh, some of your translations probably start out with a therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, what are you supposed to do? See why it's there. See what it's there for. So in 5.1, it starts out with a therefore, and it refers back to chapter, the end of chapter 4. And so he's saying that get rid of all of this stuff. Get rid of bitterness. That could be an ouch for some of us. Get rid of bitterness. This isn't, this isn't the body of Christ. Bitterness. You bitter at parents. You bitter at siblings. You bitter at grandparents. You bitter at your boss. You bitter at the government. Get rid of it. Get rid of bitterness. And what? If you haven't cir circled the all, <laughs> get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage. Get rid of all anger. Get rid of all harsh words. Ouch. Slander all types of evil behavior. Instead, then he, then he shows what it's supposed to be like as a follower of Christ. And he says, just as. So he's given us the example of just as God through Christ has forgiven. This behavior, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as 
Jesus did this. Therefore, 5-1, therefore. Now the King James, if you have the King James Bible, I think it does the poorest translation when it says follower. NIV does a little bit better when it talks about being a follower of Jesus. I think the NLT here gets it the most accurate and gets it the most precise when it talks about being an imitator of. The Greek word is where we get our word mimic from. That you are to, Im- you are to mimic. It's not just a follower Because a lot of us, most of us, if not all of us, we say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus, but our behaviors don't mimic, don't imitate the behavior, the attitude, the life of Jesus. We can say, well, I'm a follower. The Greek word here is a little more specific and a little more um, reflective of what we're supposed to do, that we are supposed to mimic his behavior. We're supposed to imitate his behavior. And that's what Paul's saying. Therefore, because this, you're not supposed to live as the world does. Therefore, because this is what Jesus did, this is how Jesus lived. Therefore, mimic his behavior, mimic his attitude. These things that he just contrasted, uh, that he said, you know, the, the anger, the harsh words, Jesus didn't do that. Therefore, we're supposed to mimic his behavior. We're supposed to get rid of all the garbage, all the junk, all the harsh words, all the anger, all the lust, all the inappropriate stuff, and imitate, mimic the behavior, the life, the attitude, the speech of Jesus. This is what Paul is laying out here for the people. And in verse 1, he says, some stuff? He says, no, in everything. Everything's not a mystery. Everything. The way you live your life, the way you talk, what we ingest, where we go, what we do, how we talk, everything. How you're an employee, how you're a boss, everything. In everything you do, do this. Then he says something interesting. End of verse 2. So he says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around sacrifices. Have you ever been around some of that stuff? Probably not. If you've been around dead animals... You know that dead animals don't stink too well. I mean, they they stink kind of nasty. So when he's talking about sacrifice, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was a nasty affair. It was a bloody ordeal. If you go back and you read the Old Testament, there was so much blood that, that there was flowing on the ground around the altar. The priests would have been covered in this. It was not a pretty thing. It was a... It was an active, it was a gross, and, and if you, like I said, you've been around dead animals, they, they tend to stink. But what does Jesus say about this? That the sacrifice is a pleasing aroma. It's a pleasing aroma. I, 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 don't, I don't like fish. I, if it comes out of the water, I don't like to eat it. I've tried most of it, but I don't like it. Um, and, and you can't, don't, don't tell me, well, you haven't had it the way I fix it. I, you're, you're wrong. It's still gross. I still won't like it. I can eat it. It's not an allergy. I just don't like it. It's, a, and it's, you know what? It's okay. It's okay that I don't like fish. Some people almost get offended. Well, you don't like trout? It's like, no. No, you don't like lobster? No. No. I, I, I don't, and it's okay. I, I, I can actually, when I, when I know when I'm in a restaurant close to somebody who has ordered fish, I get that smell. I, I just don't like it. I, and, and nothing you can say, it's not a pleasing aroma to me. It's not. Now, the smell of farms Mm. Smell, of what? smell of farms 
As kids, we'd be driving through the country. You know, we lived down in Oxford. Drive through the country, we'd be going by, by, going by a farm. I'd roll the windows down. Mmm, smell that. That's a beef farm. Or that's a dairy farm. You know, they all smell different. Pig farm? Oh, pig farms. Whew. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. The kids would be in the back seat going, oh, dad, it's gross. Roll the windows up. That's gross. Oh, that's just a pleasing aroma. That's a pleasing aroma. You go up to Croswell and, you know, you got the, you got the, well, you used to have the pickle plant up there. Croswell, hometown, stinkingest town in the country. Because you ha- used to have the pickle plant. That's gone. So you had the pickle plant smell in the summer. And you have the beet factory smell in the winter. And the beet factory smell is kind of nasty. You talk to farmers, they go, hmm, smells like money to me. <laughs> they like the smell. There is this aroma that affects us and bring back, brings back memories. When we were on vacation a couple weeks ago, um, we like to cook all of our meals over the fire. And so we had, the, we had the fire going, it's 90 degrees, and I'm still standing over the fire. Love it. Sweat just adds flavor to the meat. <laughs> just kidding. But I'm cooking over the fire, and, you know, we marinate it, and I, I dump the marinade in the fi- next to the fire in the pit, and, and it started to smell. And it was a reminder, my grandpa Swank has been gone for years, but he was a meat cutter. And that fat started to cook, and that smell instantly took me back to my grandpa's butcher shop. And once again, I was like seven, eight years old in my grandpa's presence, cutting up meat. Smell is a powerful, powerful trigger. It's a powerful indicator. It's a powerful connection that we have to people, places, events. So Jesus says, or Paul says, that our sacrifice is a pleasing aroma to Jesus. When we sacrifice for him and we give up this behavior, when we give up this lifestyle, when we give up this speech, when we give this stuff up that is not honoring God, when we give this up, Jesus goes, oh, I love that. Thank you. It's pleasing, but you know that aroma to other people is kind of nasty. They don't understand it. Just like your response to me when I was talking about the smell of hog farms. First time Becky came to visit me at college, I took her to the hog farm I worked on. And I'm walking through the barn all proud. This is where I work. These are my pigs. They weren't mine. I was like, these, and she's just like, Why was there a second date? (laughs) But when we sacrifice our life for Jesus, when we give up this type of behavior, when we give up this type of life, when we give up coarse jokes, man, I used to be able to, when I worked in the factory, I could make a sexual joke about anything. I I could be inappropriate all day long. Coarse jokes aren't pleasing to him. Language is not pleasing to him, inappropriate language. You have this whole list of things here that is not pleasing. The world doesn't understand it when we give this kind of stuff up. And they may make fun of us. They may laugh at us. And you know what? I don't care if you laugh that I think pigs smell good. Because I like pigs. Y'all know that. Why do we care so much if people don't understand the way we live our life? Why can we not say that the things that you like the smell of? Some people like pumpkin spice candles. Other people smell a pumpkin spice candle and just like, it's gross. Pine candles, pine candles, eh. If we like it, we don't care what you like. I'm going to burn my pine candle. Why are we that way in life with what we drive, with what we wear, 
I don't care if you like it or not. I like it. It makes me feel comfortable. It makes me feel good, so I'm going to do it. Why don't we do that in our relationship with Jesus? Why do we live our life at work differently and we're afraid of what other people are going to say that we might offend them? We have a pine candle burning in our office that everybody's offended at and we don't care. But what about the way we talk in our language? Our attitudes, our anger, our harsh words. These things that Paul lays out here and says, these are not of God. And the aroma of our life that we give off is displeasing or pleasing to God. That he smells our life and maybe we smell a little bit like rotten fish. And God looks at our life and he says, I don't like it. You don't smell like me. You're not mimicking me. You're not looking like me. You're not doing what I did. You're not talking the way I talked. You're not going the places that I went. You're not doing the things that I did. You're not sacrificing your life for me. That's not a pleasing aroma. When we sacrifice our life for him, when we give up coarse jokes, when we give up inappropriate language, when we give up harsh words, when we give up anger, when we give up all these things that we just read, God goes, You smell like me. You look like me. I used to love Aqua Velva aftershave. <laughs> Come on now. You don't know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> because Dad wore it. Old Spice. I don't know if that's a good uh, or a nice uh, because I wanted to smell like, I wanted to smell like him. What about our life? Do you smell like Jesus? Does your attitude reflect his? If somebody were to see your life, if they were to listen to your words, would they say, oh, you smell like Jesus. You look like Jesus. I don't know what Jesus looks like, but if I had to put a face on him, if I had to put a body on him, I think he might look like you. Because Jesus took care of the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners, and I see you doing that. Jesus was kind and, and, and gentle with people who didn't know him. You're kind and gentle to me because I don't know Jesus, and you love me. I don't get that. It doesn't make sense. Who are we trying to please with our life and the way we live our life? Are we trying to smell good to those people around us? Are we trying to get into the right clothes that is most popular? Or is our life about living a pleasing aroma and mimicking the life of Jesus? If you want to live the life of a Christian, you have to imitate Christ. If you look back to, at, at, at Christians, you know we know in Acts that is when um, Christians are first called Christians. You know, these people who, who uh, um, were followers of the way earlier in the New Testament is called the way. Um, but later it became, a, it became a derogatory term that culture assigned to Christians. Oh, you Christians. It literally means little Christ's. Culture tried to assign a negative connotation to make it a negative name to label those who follow Jesus. The early church took it as a badge. That's right. I'm a little Christ. I look like him. I walk like him. I talk like him. I smell like him. And they, and they wore that as a badge of honor. Yes, we're Christians. You may say it as a negative term. We may stink to you. The aroma that we're giving off, you may not like. 
We like it. And I know God likes it. So I don't care what you think. I'm going to live my life this way. I'm, I'm going to do things His way. I'm going to honor Him by the way I talk and the way I think and the things that I do. I'm going to honor Him. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, not sorry. Because I know that Jesus smells me and He just goes, that's my kid. That's my child. And that, that pleases me. Therefore, in everything you do, imitate Jesus. Imitate him. Do you stink pretty? Do you stink like Jesus? Somebody look at your life where they say, I'll bet that's what Jesus would have done. It's not a bracelet that we wear on our wrist. It's a life that we lay out and sacrifice for him. Do we honor him? Do we go to the needy? Do we go to the widows, the orphans, the foreigners? Do we serve the least of these? That's what Jesus smelled like. What do you smell like? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Are you imitating? Are you mimicking? Are you living like Jesus did? We often <clears throat> want to know how far we can go in this world and still be okay spiritually. Don't we? It's, it t tends to be human nature. How far is too far? What can I do? How, um, how far can I go in this physical relationship? How, how, much, how much is too much to drink? Um, well, Jesus got angry, so it's okay for me to be angry. Well, Jesus did this, so I can, I can do this. The, shir the, the shirts, um, Jesus took naps, be like Jesus. Have you seen those? There are shirts around Jesus took naps, be like Jesus. Um, uh, so you know, Jesus drank wine, be like Jesus. Like, these are, they're kind of cute, kind of funny. I look at them too and also say, well, they're kind of self-serving. We want to know often how far we can go and how much we can do and how much we can get away with and still be okay. What Paul is talking about here is not that attitude. He's talking about mimicking, being exactly like Jesus living like him, thinking like him, acting like him, talking like him, doing what he did. Are you imitating Jesus? We're going to close. Um, so Randy and the gang, um, why don't you come on up. The altars are open. If there's something in your life that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about saying, you know what, you've got this wrong. You've been using it as an excuse and it stinks to me. It's not a pleasing aroma. It doesn't smell like me at all. The altars are open if you'd like to come and pray. Today is going to be very personal. Nobody's going to come and pray with you. So if you want to come and kneel, it's going to be just you. We're not going to, nobody's going to come and, and, and sit, stand next to you. Um, but making a commitment to say, you know what, Holy Spirit, God, I want to smell like you. I want to act like you. And I realize that I've, I've not been doing this right. Um, maybe you need to make a note of what you need to change. The Spirit's speaking to you. Um, but I want to encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life and say, this doesn't smell right to me. What you're doing doesn't smell right. And you need to change it because this is what I would do and you know what he would do. So let's stand and sing. Allow the Spirit to speak truth into your mind. Allow Him to mess with you. Allow Him to change you and challenge your behavior and thoughts. Let's sing together and respond. I was asking Michael as we were preparing early before the service and asking him how he would close and telling him this song really is a beautiful song to remind us about a baptism this afternoon. I will never be the same again. But the song immediately as we began to sing it in practice of like, this is exactly what Michael's talking about in the message. And so it's a perfect way to run the race 
to simply let God come upon us and us be so much like him. Think about that, these words, and, and simply respond. Respond to God. Just let him just do something radically different in you as you respond.